George Barclay, the 12th of March 1685 to the 14th of January 1753, known as Bishop Barclay, Bishop of Cloyne, was an Irish philosopher whose primary achievement was the advancement of a theory he called immaterialism, later referred to as subjective idealism by others. This theory denies the existence of material substance and instead contends that familiar objects like tables and chairs are only ideas in the minds of perceivers and, as a result, cannot exist without being perceived. Berkeley is also known for his critique of abstraction, an important premise in his argument for immaterialism. Berkeley was the namesake of the city of Berkeley, California, which is perhaps most famous as the home of the prestigious university. In 1709, Berkeley published his first major work, An Essay Towards a New Theory of Vision, in which he discussed the limitations of human vision and advanced the theory that the proper objects of sight are not material objects, but light and color. This foreshadowed his chief philosophical work, A Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge, in 1710, which, after its poor reception, he rewrote in dialogue form and published under the title Three Dialogues Between Hylas and Philonus in 1713. In this book, Berkeley's views were represented by Philonus, Greek, lover of mind, while Hylas, Greek, matter, embodies the Irish thinker's opponents, in particular John Locke. Berkeley argued against Isaac Newton's doctrine of absolute space, time and motion in De Motu on motion, published 1721. His arguments were a precursor to the views of Mach and Einstein. In 1732, he published Alciphron, a Christian apologetic against the free thinkers, and in 1734, he published The Analyst, a critique of the foundations of calculus, which was influential in the development of mathematics. His last major philosophical work, Cyrus 1744, begins by advocating the medicinal use of tar water and then continues to discuss a wide range of topics, including science, philosophy, and theology. Interest in Berkeley's work increased after World War II because he tackled many of the issues of paramount interest to philosophy in the 20th century, such as the problems of perception, the difference between primary and secondary qualities, and the importance of language. Topic. Biography Topic. Ireland Berkeley was born at his family home, Dissert Castle, near Thomastown, County Kilkenny, Ireland, the eldest son of William Berkeley, a cadet of the noble family of Berkeley. Little is known of his mother. He was educated at Kilkenny College and attended Trinity College, Dublin, where he was elected a scholar in 1702, earning a bachelor's degree in 1704 and completing a master's degree in 1707. He remained at Trinity College after completion of his degree as a tutor and Greek lecturer. His earliest publication was on mathematics, but the first that brought him notice was his An Essay Towards a New Theory of Vision, first published in 1709. In the essay, Berkeley examines visual distance, magnitude, position and problems of sight and touch. While this work raised much controversy at the time, its conclusions are now accepted as an established part of the theory of optics. The next publication to appear was the treatise concerning the principles of human knowledge in 1710, which had great success and gave him a lasting reputation, though few accepted his theory that nothing exists outside the mind. This was followed in 1713 by three dialogues between Hylas and Philonus, in which he propounded his system of philosophy, the leading principle of which is that the world, as represented by our senses, depends for its existence on being perceived. For this theory, the principles gives the exposition and the dialogues the defense. One of his main objectives was to combat the prevailing materialism of his time. The theory was largely received with ridicule, while even those such as Samuel Clarke and William Whiston, who did acknowledge his extraordinary genius, were nevertheless convinced that his first principles were false. Topic. England and Europe Shortly afterwards, Berkeley visited England and was received into the circle of Addison, Pope and Steele. In the period between 1714 and 1720, he interspersed his academic endeavors with periods of extensive travel in Europe, including one of the most extensive grand tours of the length and breadth of Italy ever undertaken. In 1721, he took holy orders in the Church of Ireland, earning his doctorate in divinity, and once again chose to remain at Trinity College Dublin, lecturing this time in divinity and in Hebrew. 
In 1721 halves he was made Dean of Dromore and, in 1724, Dean of Derry. In 1723, following her violent quarrel with Jonathan Swift, who had been her intimate friend for many years, Esther Van Homerig, for whom Swift had created the nickname, Vanessa. Named Berkeley her co-heir along with the barrister Robert Marshall, her choice of legatees caused a good deal of surprise since she did not know either of them well, although Berkeley as a very young man had known her father. Swift said generously that he did not grudge Berkeley his inheritance, much of which vanished in a lawsuit in any event. A story that Berkeley and Marshall disregarded a condition of the inheritance that they must publish the correspondence between Swift and Vanessa is probably untrue. In 1725, he began the project of founding a college in Bermuda for training ministers and missionaries in the colony, in pursuit of which he gave up his deanery with its income of £1,100. Marriage in America In 1728, he married Anne Forster, daughter of John Forster, Chief Justice of the Irish Common Pleas, and his first wife Rebecca Monk. He then went to America on a salary of £100 per annum. He landed near Newport, Rhode Island, where he bought a plantation at Middletown, the famous Whitehall. It has been claimed that he introduced Palladianism into America by borrowing a design from William Kent's designs of Inigo Jones for the door case of his house in Rhode Island, Whitehall. He also brought to New England John Smibert, the British artist he discovered in Italy, who is generally regarded as the founding father of American portrait painting. Meanwhile, he drew up plans for the ideal city he planned to build on Bermuda. He lived at the plantation while he waited for funds for his college to arrive. The funds, however, were not forthcoming, and in 1732 he left America and returned to London. He and Anne had four children who survived infancy, Henry, George, William and Julia, and at least two other children who died in infancy. William's death in 1751 was a great cause of grief to his father. Topic. Humanitarian work While living in London's Seville Street, he took part in efforts to create a home for the city's abandoned children. The Foundling Hospital was founded by Royal Charter in 1739, and Berkeley is listed as one of its original governors. In 1734, he was appointed Bishop of Cloyne in Ireland, a position he was to hold until his death. Soon afterwards, he published Alciphron, or the Minute Philosopher, directed against both Shaftesbury and Bernard de Mandeville, and in 1735-37 the Chorist. <laughs> Last works His last two publications were Cyrus, a chain of philosophical reflections and inquiries concerning the virtues of tarwater, and divers other subjects connected together and arising one from another 1744, and further thoughts on tar water 1752. Pine tar is an effective antiseptic and disinfectant when applied to cuts on the skin, but Berkeley argued for the use of pine tar as a broad panacea for diseases. His 1744 work on tar water sold more copies than any of his other books during Berkeley's lifetime. He remained at Cloyne until 1752, when he retired. With his wife and daughter Julia he went to Oxford to live with his son George and supervise his education. He died soon afterward and was buried in Christ Church Cathedral, Oxford. His affectionate disposition and genial manners made him much loved and held in warm regard by many of his contemporaries. Anne outlived her husband by many years, and died in 1786. Topic. Contributions to philosophy According to Berkeley there are only two kinds of things, spirits and ideas. Spirits are simple, active beings which produce and perceive ideas, ideas are passive beings which are produced and perceived. The use of the concepts of spirit and idea is central in berkeley's philosophy as used by him these concepts are difficult to translate into modern terminology his concept of spirit is close to the concept of conscious subject or of mind and the concept of idea is close to the concept of sensation or state of mind or conscious experience
Thus Berkeley denied the existence of matter as a metaphysical substance, but did not deny the existence of physical objects such as apples or mountains. I do not argue against the existence of any one thing that we can apprehend, either by sense or reflection. That the things I see with mine eyes and touch with my hands do exist, really exist, I make not the least question. The only thing whose existence we deny, is that which philosophers call matter or corporeal substance. And in doing of this, there is no damage done to the rest of mankind, who, I dare say, will never miss it. Principles No. 35 This basic claim of Berkeley's thought, his «idealism» is sometimes and somewhat derisively called «immaterialism» or, occasionally, subjective idealism. In Principles No. 3, he wrote, using a combination of Latin and English, esse is percipi to be as to be perceived, most often if slightly inaccurately attributed to Berkeley as the pure Latin phrase esse est percipi. The phrase appears associated with him in authoritative philosophical sources, e.g., Berkeley holds that there are no such mind-independent things, that, in the famous phrase, esse est percipi aut percipere to be as to be perceived or to perceive. Hence, human knowledge is reduced to two elements, that of spirits and of ideas principles number 86. In contrast to ideas, a spirit cannot be perceived. A person's spirit, which perceives ideas, is to be comprehended intuitively by inward feeling or reflection principles number 89. For Berkeley, we have no direct idea of spirits, albeit we have good reason to believe in the existence of other spirits, for their existence explains the purposeful regularities we find in experience. It is plain that we cannot know the existence of other spirits otherwise than by their operations, or the ideas by them excited in us. Dialogues No. 145. This is the solution that Berkeley offers to the problem of other minds. Finally, the order and purposefulness of the whole of our experience of the world and especially of nature overwhelms us into believing in the existence of an extremely powerful and intelligent spirit that causes that order. According to Berkeley, reflection on the attributes of that external spirit leads us to identify it with God. Thus a material thing such as an apple consists of a collection of ideas shape, color, taste, physical properties, etc. which are caused in the spirits of humans by the Spirit of God. Topic. Theology A convinced adherent of Christianity, Berkeley believed God to be present as an immediate cause of all our experiences. He did not evade the question of the external source of the diversity of the sense data at the disposal of the human individual. He strove simply to show that the causes of sensations could not be things, because what we called things, and considered without grounds to be something different from our sensations, were built up wholly from sensations. There must consequently be some other external source of the inexhaustible diversity of sensations. The source of our sensations, Berkeley concluded, could only be God, he gave them to man, who had to see in them signs and symbols that carried God's word. Here is Berkeley's proof of the existence of God. Whatever power I may have over my own thoughts, I find the ideas actually perceived by sense have not a like dependence on my will. When in broad daylight I open my eyes, it is not in my power to choose whether I shall see or know, or to determine what particular objects shall present themselves to my view, and so likewise as to the hearing and other senses, the ideas imprinted on them are not creatures of my will. There is therefore some other will or spirit that produces them. Berkeley. Principles No. 29 As T.I. Oyserman explained, Berkeley's mystic idealism as Kant aptly christened it claimed that nothing separated man and God except materialist misconceptions, of course, since nature or matter did not exist as a reality independent of consciousness. The revelation of God was directly accessible to man, according to this doctrine, it was the sense-perceived world, the world of man's sensations, which came to him from on high for him to decipher and so grasp the divine purpose. Berkeley believed that God is not the distant engineer of Newtonian machinery that in the fullness of time led to the growth of a tree in the university quadrangle. Rather, the perception of the tree is an idea that God's mind has produced in the mind, and the tree continues to exist in the quadrangle when nobody is there, simply because God is an infinite mind that perceives all. The philosophy of David Hume concerning causality and objectivity is an elaboration of another aspect of Berkeley's philosophy. 
A. A. Luce, the most eminent Berkeley scholar of the 20th century, constantly stressed the continuity of Berkeley's philosophy. The fact that Berkeley returned to his major works throughout his life, issuing revised editions with only minor changes, also counts against any theory that attributes to him a significant volt face. Topic: <laughs> Relativity arguments. John Locke, Berkeley's predecessor, states that we define an object by its primary and secondary qualities. He takes heat as an example of a secondary quality. If you put one hand in a bucket of cold water, and the other hand in a bucket of warm water, then put both hands in a bucket of lukewarm water, one of your hands is going to tell you that the water is cold and the other that the water is hot. Locke says that since two different objects both your hands perceive the water to be hot and cold, then the heat is not a quality of the water. While Locke used this argument to distinguish primary from secondary qualities, Berkeley extends it to cover primary qualities in the same way. For example, he says that size is not a quality of an object because the size of the object depends on the distance between the observer and the object, or the size of the observer. Since an object is a different size to different observers, then size is not a quality of the object. Berkeley rejects shape with a similar argument and then asks, if neither primary qualities nor secondary qualities are of the object, then how can we say that there is anything more than the qualities we observe? Topic. New theory of vision In his essay Towards a New Theory of Vision, Berkeley frequently criticized the views of the optic writers, a title that seems to include Molyneux, Wallace, Malbranche and Descartes. In sections 1–51, Berkeley argued against the classical scholars of optics by holding that, spatial depth, as the distance that separates the perceiver from the perceived object is itself invisible. That is, we do not see space directly or deduce its form logically using the laws of optics. Space for Berkeley is no more than a contingent expectation that visual and tactile sensations will follow one another in regular sequences that we come to expect through habit. Berkeley goes on to argue that visual cues, such as the perceived extension or confusion of an object, can only be used to indirectly judge distance, because the viewer learns to associate visual cues with tactile sensations. Berkeley gives the following analogy regarding indirect distance perception, one perceives distance indirectly just as one perceives a person's embarrassment indirectly. When looking at an embarrassed person, we infer indirectly that the person is embarrassed by observing the red color on the person's face. We know through experience that a red face tends to signal embarrassment, as we've learned to associate the two. The question concerning the visibility of space was central to the Renaissance perspective tradition and its reliance on classical optics in the development of pictorial representations of spatial depth. This matter was debated by scholars since the 11th century Arab polymath and mathematician Al-Hazan al ibn al affirmed in experimental contexts the visibility of space. This issue, which was raised in Berkeley's Theory of Vision, was treated at length in the Phenomenology of Perception of Maurice Merleau-Ponty, in the context of confirming the visual perception of spatial depth La Profondeur, and by way of refuting Berkeley's thesis, Berkeley wrote about the perception of size in addition to that of distance. He is frequently misquoted as believing in size-distance invariance, a view held by the optic writers. This idea is that we scale the image size according to distance in a geometrical manner. The error may have become commonplace because the eminent historian and psychologist E.G. Boring perpetuated it. In fact, Berkeley argued that the same cues that evoke distance also evoke size, and that we do not first see size and then calculate distance. It is worth quoting Berkeley's words on this issue section 53, what inclines men to this mistake beside the humor of making one see by geometry is, that the same perceptions or ideas which suggest distance, do also suggest magnitude. I say they do not first suggest distance, and then leave it to the judgment to use that as a medium, whereby to collect the magnitude, but they have as close and immediate a connection with the magnitude as with the distance, and suggest magnitude as independently of distance, as they do distance independently of magnitude. Topic philosophy of physics Berkeley's works display his keen interest in natural philosophy, from his earliest writings Arithmetica, 1707, to his latest Cyrus, 1744. Moreover, much of his philosophy is shaped fundamentally by his engagement with the science of his time. The profundity of this interest can be judged from numerous entries in Berkeley's Philosophical Commentaries, 1707 to 1708, e.g. 
Mem. to examine and accurately discuss the scholium of the eighth definition of Mr. Newton's Principia, number 316. Berkeley argued that forces and gravity, as defined by Newton, constituted occult qualities that expressed nothing distinctly. He held that those who posited something unknown in a body of which they have no idea and which they call the principle of motion, are in fact simply stating that the principle of motion is unknown. Therefore, those who affirm that active force, action, and the principle of motion are really in bodies are adopting an opinion not based on experience. Forces and gravity existed nowhere in the phenomenal world. On the other hand, if they resided in the category of soul or incorporeal thing, they do not properly belong to physics as a matter. Berkeley thus concluded that forces lay beyond any kind of empirical observation and could not be a part of proper science. He proposed his theory of signs as a means to explain motion and matter without reference to the occult qualities of force and gravity. Topic Berkeley's razor Berkeley's razor is a rule of reasoning proposed by the philosopher Karl Popper in his study of Berkeley's key scientific work De Motu. Berkeley's razor is considered by Popper to be similar to Occam's razor but more powerful. It represents an extreme, empiricist view of scientific observation that states that the scientific method provides us with no true insight into the nature of the world. Rather, the scientific method gives us a variety of partial explanations about regularities that hold in the world and that are gained through experiment. The nature of the world, according to Berkeley, is only approached through properly metaphysical speculation and reasoning. Popper summarizes Berkeley's razor as such, a general practical result, which I propose to call Berkeley's razor, of Berkeley's analysis of physics allows us a priori to eliminate from physical science all essentialist explanations. If they have a mathematical and predictive content they may be admitted qua mathematical hypotheses while their essentialist interpretation is eliminated. If not they may be ruled out altogether. This razor is sharper than Occam's, all entities are ruled out except those which are perceived. Topic philosophy of mathematics In addition to his contributions to philosophy, Berkeley was also very influential in the development of mathematics, although in a rather indirect sense. Berkeley was concerned with mathematics and its philosophical interpretation from the earliest stages of his intellectual life. Berkeley's philosophical commentaries 1707-1708 witness to his interest in mathematics, axiom. No reasoning about things whereof we have no idea. Therefore no reasoning about infinitesimals, number 354 take away the signs from arithmetic and algebra, and pray what remains? Number 767, these are sciences purely verbal, and entirely useless but for practice in societies of men. No speculative knowledge, no comparison of ideas in them, number 768 in 1707, Berkeley published two treatises on mathematics. In 1734, he published The Analyst, subtitled A Discourse Addressed to an Infidel Mathematician, a Critique of Calculus. Florian Cahori called this treatise the most spectacular event of the century in the history of British mathematics, however, a recent study suggests that Berkeley misunderstood Leibnizian calculus. The mathematician in question is believed to have been either Edmund Halley, or Isaac Newton himself, though if to the latter, then the discourse was posthumously addressed, as Newton died in 1727. The analyst represented a direct attack on the foundations and principles of calculus and, in particular, the notion of fluxion or infinitesimal change, which Newton and Leibniz used to develop the calculus. In his critique, Berkeley coined the phrase ghosts of departed quantities, familiar to students of calculus. Ian Stewart's book From Here to Infinity captures the gist of his criticism. Berkeley regarded his criticism of calculus as part of his broader campaign against the religious implications of Newtonian mechanics, as a defense of traditional Christianity against deism, which tends to distance God from his worshippers. Specifically, he observed that both Newtonian and Leibnizian calculus employed infinitesimals sometimes as positive, non-zero quantities and other times as a number explicitly equal to zero. Berkeley's key point in The Analyst was that Newton's calculus and the laws of motion based in calculus lacked rigorous theoretical foundations. He claimed that in every other science men prove their conclusions by their principles, and not their principles by the conclusions. But if in yours you should allow yourselves this unnatural way of proceeding, the consequence would be that you must take up with induction, and bid adieu to demonstration. And if you submit to this, your authority will no longer lead the way in points of reason and science. Berkeley did not doubt that calculus produced real-world truth, simple physics experiments could verify that Newton's method did what it claimed to do. 
the cause of fluxions cannot be defended by reason, but the results could be defended by empirical observation, Berkeley's preferred method of acquiring knowledge at any rate. Berkeley, however, found it paradoxical that mathematicians should deduce true propositions from false principles, be right in conclusion, and yet err in the premises. In The Analyst he endeavored to show how error may bring forth truth, though it cannot bring forth science. Newton's science, therefore, could not on purely scientific grounds justify its conclusions, and the mechanical, deistic model of the universe could not be rationally justified. The difficulties raised by Berkeley were still present in the work of Cauchy, whose approach to calculus was a combination of infinitesimals and a notion of limit, and were eventually sidestepped by Weierstrass by means of his epsilon /delta approach, which eliminated infinitesimals altogether. More recently, Abraham Robinson restored infinitesimal methods in his 1966 book Non-Standard Analysis by showing that they can be used rigorously. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Moral Philosophy. The tract A Discourse on Passive Obedience, 1712, is considered Berkeley's major contribution to moral and political philosophy. In A Discourse on Passive Obedience, Berkeley defends the thesis that people have a moral duty to observe the negative precepts prohibitions of the law, including the duty not to resist the execution of punishment. However, Berkeley does make exceptions to this sweeping moral statement, stating that we need not observe precepts of usurpers or even madmen, and that people can obey different supreme authorities if there are more than one claims to the highest authority. Berkeley defends this thesis with a deductive proof stemming from the laws of nature. First, he establishes that because God is perfectly good, the end to which he commands humans must also be good, and that end must not benefit just one person, but the entire human race. Because these commands, or laws, if practiced, would lead to the general fitness of humankind, it follows that they can be discovered by the right reason. For example, the law to never resist supreme power can be derived from reason because this law is the only thing that stands between us and total disorder. Thus, these laws can be called the laws of nature, because they are derived from God, the creator of nature himself. These laws of nature include duties never to resist the supreme power, lie under oath, or do evil so that good may come of it. One may view Berkeley's doctrine on passive obedience as a kind of theological utilitarianism, insofar as it states that we have a duty to uphold a moral code which presumably is working towards the ends of promoting the good of humankind. However, the concept of ordinary utilitarianism is fundamentally different in that it makes utility the one and only ground of obligation. That is, utilitarianism is concerned with whether particular actions are morally permissible in specific situations, while Berkeley's doctrine is concerned with whether or not we should follow moral rules in any and all circumstances. Whereas utilitarianism might, for example, justify a morally impermissible act in light of the specific situation, Berkeley's doctrine of passive obedience holds that it is never morally permissible to not follow a moral rule, even when it seems like breaking that moral rule might achieve the happiest ends. Berkeley holds that even though sometimes, the consequences of an action in a specific situation might be bad, the general tendencies of that action benefits humanity. Other important sources for Berkeley's views on morality are Alsifron 1732, especially Dialogues I-3, and the Discourse to Magistrates 1738. Passive obedience is notable partly for containing one of the earliest statements of rule utilitarianism. Immaterialism George Berkeley's theory that matter does not exist comes from the belief that "...sensible things are those only which are immediately perceived by sense." Berkeley says in his book called The Principles of Human Knowledge that the ideas of sense are stronger, livelier, and clearer than those of the imagination, and they are also steady, orderly and coherent Berkeley 18. From this we can tell that the things that we are perceiving are truly real rather than it just being a dream. All knowledge comes from perception, what we perceive are ideas, not things in themselves, a thing in itself must be outside experience, so the world only consists of ideas and minds that perceive those ideas, a thing only exists so far as it perceives or is perceived. Through this we can see that consciousness is considered something that exists to Berkeley due to its ability to perceive. To be, said of the object, means to be perceived, to be, said of the subject, means to perceive or 
Ses Percipi. Berkeley's ideas were somewhat controversial due to his arguments refuting Descartes' worldview, which was expanded upon by Locke, and the rejection of Berkeley's form of empiricism by several philosophers of the 17th and 18th centuries. In Locke's worldview, the world causes the perceptual ideas we have of it by the way it interacts with our senses. This contradicts with Berkeley's worldview because not only does it suggest the existence of physical causes in the world, but in fact there is no physical world beyond our ideas. The only causes that exist in Berkeley's worldview are those that are a result of the use of the will. Berkeley's theory relies heavily on his form of empiricism, which in turn relies heavily on the senses. His empiricism can be defined by five propositions, all significant words stand for ideas, all knowledge about our ideas, all ideas come from without or from within, if from without it must be by the senses, and they are called sensations, if from within they are the operations of the mind, and are called thoughts. Berkeley clarifies his distinction between ideas by saying they are imprinted on the senses, perceived by attending to the passions and operations of the mind, or are formed by help of memory and imagination." One refutation of his idea was, if someone leaves a room and stops perceiving that room does that room no longer exist? Berkeley answers this by claiming that it is still being perceived and the consciousness that is doing the perceiving is God. This claim is the only thing holding up his argument which is, "...depending for our knowledge of the world, and of the existence of other minds, upon a God that would never deceive us." Berkeley's argument hinges upon an omniscient, omnipresent deity. Topic. Influence Berkeley's treatise concerning the principles of human knowledge was published three years before the publication of Arthur Collier's Clavis Universalis, which made assertions similar to those of Berkeley's. However, there seemed to have been no influence or communication between the two writers. German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer once wrote of him, Berkeley was, therefore, the first to treat the subjective starting point really seriously and to demonstrate irrefutably its absolute necessity. He is the father of idealism. George Berkeley has gone down in the handbooks as a great spokesman of British empiricism. Today, every student of the history of philosophy is familiar with the view that there was a sort of linear development involving three great British empiricists. Leading from Locke through Berkeley to Hume, Berkeley influenced many modern philosophers, especially David Hume. Thomas Reed admitted that he put forward a drastic criticism of Berkeleyanism after he had been an admirer of Berkeley's philosophical system for a long time. Berkeley's Thought made possible the work of Hume and thus Kant, notes Alfred North Whitehead. Some authors draw a parallel between Berkeley and Edmund Husserl. When Berkeley visited America, the American educator Samuel Johnson visited him, and the two later corresponded. Johnson convinced Berkeley to establish a scholarship program at Yale, and to donate a large number of books as well as his plantation to the college when the philosopher returned to England. It was one of Yale's largest and most important donations, it doubled its library holdings, improved the college's financial position and brought Anglican religious ideas and English culture into New England. Johnson also took Berkeley's philosophy and used parts of it as a framework for his own American practical idealism school of philosophy. As Johnson's philosophy was taught to about half the graduates of American colleges between 1743 and 1776, and over half of the contributors to the Declaration of Independence were connected to it, Berkeley's ideas were indirectly a foundation of the American mind. Outside of America, during Berkeley's lifetime his philosophical ideas were comparatively uninfluential. But interest in his doctrine grew from the 1870s when Alexander Campbell Fraser the leading Berkeley scholar of the 19th century, published The Works of George Berkeley. A powerful impulse to serious studies in Berkeley's philosophy was given by A. A. Luce and Thomas Edmund Jessop, two of the 20th century's foremost Berkeley scholars, thanks to whom Berkeley scholarship was raised to the rank of a special area of historica philosophical science. The proportion of Berkeley scholarship, in literature on the history of philosophy, is increasing. This can be judged from the most comprehensive bibliographies on George Berkeley. During the period of 1709-1932, about 300 writings on Berkeley were published. That amounted to 1.5 publication per annum. 
During the course of 1932–79, over 1,000 works were brought out, i.e., 20 works per annum. Since then, the number of publications has reached 30 per annum. In 1977 publication began in Ireland of a special journal on Berkeley's life and thought Berkeley studies. Other than philosophy, Berkeley also influenced modern psychology with his work on John Locke's theory of association and how it could be used to explain how humans gain knowledge in the physical world. He also used the theory to explain perception, stating that all qualities were, as Locke would call them, secondary qualities therefore perception laid entirely in the perceiver and not in the object. These are both topics today studied in modern psychology. Topic. Commemoration The University of California, Berkeley, was named after him, although the pronunciation has evolved to suit American English, Berkeley. The naming was suggested in 1866 by Frederick Billings, a trustee of the then College of California. Billings was inspired by Berkeley's verses on the prospect of planting arts and learning in America, particularly the final stanza, Westward the course of empire takes its way, the first four acts already passed, a fifth shall close the drama with the day, time's noblest offspring is the last. On 18 April 1735, the town of Berkeley, currently the least populated town in Bristol County, Massachusetts, was founded and named after the renowned philosopher. Located 40 miles south of Boston and 25 miles north of Middletown, Rhode Island, where Berkeley lived at his farmhouse, Whitehall Museum House remains today to commemorate the farmhouse modified by Dean George Berkeley when he lived in the northern section of Newport, Rhode Island that comprises present-day Middletown, Rhode Island in 1729-31, while working to open his planned St. Paul's College on the island of Bermuda. It is also known as Berkeley House or Bishop George Berkeley House, and was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1970. 1. A residential college and an Episcopal seminary at Yale University also bear Berkeley's name, as does the Berkeley Library at Trinity College, Dublin. Also named for him is Berkeley Preparatory School in Tampa, Florida. This leading private school is affiliated with the Episcopal Church, has almost 1,300 students from pre-kindergarten through 12th grade, and was founded in 1960. An Ulster History Circle blue plaque commemorating him is located in Bishop Street within, City of Derry. Bishop Berkeley's Gold Medals are two awards given annually at Trinity College Dublin. Provided outstanding merit is shown to candidates answering a special examination in Greek. The awards were founded in 1752 by Berkeley who was a fellow in 1707-24. Veneration Berkeley is honored together with Joseph Butler with a feast day on the liturgical calendar of the Episcopal Church on 16 June. Writings Topic. Original publications Arithmetica 1707. Miscellanea Mathematica 1707. Philosophical Commentaries or Common Place Book 1707 Notebooks An Essay Towards a New Theory of Vision 1709. A Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge, Part 1 1710. Passive Obedience, or the Christian Doctrine of Not Resisting the Supreme Power 1712. Three Dialogues between Hylas and Philonus 1713. An Essay Towards Preventing the Ruin of Great Britain 1721. De Motu 1721. A Proposal for Better Supplying Churches in Our Foreign Plantations, and for Converting the Savage Americans to Christianity by a College to be Erected in the Summer Islands 1725. A sermon preached before the Incorporated Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts 1732. Alciphron, or the Minute Philosopher 1732. The Theory of Vision, or Visual Language, Showing the Immediate Presence and Providence of a Deity, Vindicated and Explained 1733. The Analyst, a Discourse Addressed to an Infidel Mathematician 1734. A Defense of Free Thinking in Mathematics, with Appendix Concerning Mr. Walton's Vindication of Sir Isaac Newton's Principle of Fluxions 1735. Reasons for Not Replying to Mr. Walton's Full Answer 1735. 
The Quirist, containing several queries proposed to the consideration of the public three parts, 1735–7. A Discourse Addressed to Magistrates and Men of Authority 1736. Cyrus, A Chain of Philosophical Reflections and Inquiries, Concerning the Virtues of Tar Water 1744. A Letter to the Roman Catholics of the Diocese of Cloyne 1745. A Word to the Wise, or an Exhortation to the Roman Catholic Clergy of Ireland 1749. Maxims Concerning Patriotism 1750. Farther Thoughts on Tar Water 1752. Miscellany 1752. Topic. Collections The works of George Barclay, D.D., formerly Bishop of Cloyne, including many of his writings hitherto unpublished. With prefaces, annotations, his life and letters, and an account of his philosophy. Ed. by Alexander Campbell Fraser. Four volumes. Oxford, at the Clarendon Press 1871. Revised edition 1901. Topic writings on him Topic Bibliographic resources Jessup T. E., Luce AAA Bibliography of George Barclay, 2 EDN, Springer, 1973. ISBN 90-247-1577-6, ISBN 978-90-247-1577-0 Turbane CMA Bibliography of George Barclay 1963-1979 in, Berkeley, Critical and Interpretive Essays. Google Books Manchester, 1982. p. 313-329. Berkeley Bibliography 1979-2010 A supplement to those of Jessup and Turbane by Sylvia Perigi. A bibliography on George Barclay, about 300 works from the 19th century to our day's topic studies on his work Daniel, Stephen H. ed., Re-examining Berkeley's Philosophy, Toronto, University of Toronto Press, 2007. Daniel, Stephen H. Ed., New Interpretations of Berkeley's Thought, Amherst, Humanity Books, 2008. Dicker, Georges, Berkeley's Idealism. A Critical Examination, Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, 2011. Pappas, George S., Berkeley's Thought, Ithaca, Cornell University Press, 2000. Winkler, Kenneth P., The Cambridge Companion to Berkeley, Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, 2005. Stoneham, Tom, Berkeley's World, An Examination of the Three Dialogues, Oxford University Press, 2002 Topic See also Arthur Collier Church of Ireland Empiricism Idealism List of People on Stamps of Ireland George Edward Moore The Refutation of Idealism 1903, A Famous Criticism of Berkeley's Principle To Be As To Be Perceived S.E.S. Percipi, Jonathan Edwards Theologian Roy Wood Sellers Referential Transcendence, Philosophy and Phenomenological Research Philadelphia 19 61, Volume 22, No. 1, pp. 1-15, Against Berkeley's Analysis of Perception. Solipsism Talon, Yukbar, Orbis Tertius Yogacara and Consciousness Only Schools Topic References Topic Further reading Topic Primary The Works of George Berkeley. Ed. by Alexander Campbell Fraser. In four volumes. Oxford, Clarendon Press, 1901. Volume 1 Volume 2 Volume 3 Volume 4 Ewald, William B., ed., 1996. From Kant to Hilbert, a source book in the Foundations of Mathematics, 2 vols. Oxford Uni. Press, 1707. Of Infinites, 16-19, 1709. Letter to Samuel Molyneux, 19-21, 1721. De Motu, 37-54, 1734. The Analyst, 60-92. Topic Secondary This article incorporates text from a publication now in the public domain, Cousin, John William, 1910. A Short Biographical Dictionary of English Literature. London, J. M. Dent & Sons. Wikisource R. H. Nichols, F. A. Ray, 1935. The History of the Foundling Hospital. London, Oxford Univ. Press. p. 349. John Daniel Wilde 1962. George Barclay, A Study of His Life and Philosophy. New York, Russell and Russell. Fogelin, Robert 2001. Berkeley and the Principles of Human Knowledge. Routledge. Muehlman, Robert G. 1992. Berkeley's Ontology. Indianapolis, Cambridge, Hackett Publishing Company. ISBN 0-87220-146-5. 
shows a thorough mastery of the literature on Berkeley, along with very perceptive remarks about the strength and weaknesses of most of the central commentators. exhibits a mastery of all the material, both primary and secondary. Charles Larmor, for the editorial board, Journal of Philosophy. R. Muehlman is one of the Berkeley Prize winners. New Interpretations of Berkeley's Thought. Ed. by S. H. Daniel. N. Y. Humanity Books, 2008, 319 pp. ISBN 978-1-59102-557-3. For reviews see Reviewed by Mark A. Height, Hampton Sydney College Reviewed by Thomas M. Lennon, Berkeley Studies 19, 2008, 51-56. Edward Cheney 2000, George Berkeley's Grand Tours, The Immaterialist as Connoisseur of Art and Architecture, in E. Cheney, The Evolution of the Grand Tour, Anglo-Italian Cultural Relations Since the Renaissance, 2nd ed. London, Routledge. ISBN 0714644749 Costica Bratton, 2006, The Other Bishop Berkeley. An Exercise in Reenchantment, Fordham University Press, New York, Paul Strathern 2000. Berkeley in 90 Minutes. Ivan R. D. ISBN 978-1-56663-291-1. Brooke, Richard J. 1973. Berkeley's Philosophy of Science. The Hague, Martinus Nyhoff. ISBN 978-90-247-1555-8. Secondary literature available on the Internet. Most sources listed below are suggested by Dr. Talia M. Betcher in Berkeley, A Guide for the Perplexed, 2008. See the textbook's description. Berman, David. George Berkeley, Idealism and the Man. Oxford, Clarendon Press, 1994. The Cambridge Companion to Berkeley, EPUP, Google Books. Ed. by Kenneth P. Winkler. Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, 2005. ISBN 0-521-45033-0 ISBN 9780521450331. Daniel, Stephen H., ed. Re-examining Berkeley's Philosophy. Toronto, University of Toronto Press, 2007. ISBN 0-8020-9348-5 ISBN 9780802093486 Johnston G. A. The Development of Berkeley's Philosophy. London, Macmillan. Luce, A. A. Berkeley and Malbranche. A Study in the Origins of Berkeley's Thought. Oxford, Oxford University Press, 1934, second edn, with additional preface, 1967. Muehlman, Robert G., ed., 1995. Berkeley's Metaphysics. Structural, Interpretive, and Critical Essays. Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania State Press. ISBN 978-0-271-02656-5. Olskamp, Paul J. 1970. The Moral Philosophy of George Berkeley. The Hague, Martinus Nyhoff, reviewed by, Desiree Park. Studi Internazionali Philosophici 3 228-30, G. J. Warnock. Journal of Philosophy 69, 15 460-62, Gunter Gallick. Mensch Heitzklick und Will Gotes, Neues Licht auf Berkeley's Ethik. Philosophische Rundschau 1-2, January 1973, 24-42, H. M. Bracken. 18th Century Studies 3 1973, 396-97, and Stanley Green. Journal of the History of Philosophy 12, 3 1974, 398-403. Roberts, John. A Metaphysics for the Mob, The Philosophy of George Berkeley EPUP, Google Books. New York, Oxford University Press, 2007. 172p, ISBN 978-0-19-531393-2 Reviewed by Mark A. Height, University of Tartu, Hampton Sydney College Russell B. Berkeley, Bertrand Russell A. History of Western Philosophy 3, 116 Tipton, I. C. Berkeley, The Philosophy of Immaterialism London, Methuen, 1974 ISBN 0-416-70440-9 ISBN 978-0-416-70440-2
Ian C. Tipton, one of the world's great Berkeley scholars and longtime president of the International Berkeley Society. Of the many works about Berkeley that were published in the 20th century, few rival in importance his Berkeley, The Philosophy of Immaterialism. The philosophical insight, combined with the mastery of Berkeley's texts, that Ian brought to this work make it one of the masterpieces of Berkeley scholarship. It is not surprising therefore that, when the Garland Publishing Company brought out, late in 1980s, a 15-volume collection of major works on Berkeley, Ian's book was one of only two full-length studies of Berkeley published after 1935 to be included Charles J. McCracken. In memoriam, Ian C. Tipton, The Berkeley Newsletter 17 2006, p. 4. Walmsley, Peter 1990. The Rhetoric of Berkeley's Philosophy. Cambridge, Cambridge University Press. Winkler, Kenneth P. Berkeley, An Interpretation. Oxford, Clarendon Press, 1989. ISBN 0 19 Topic. External links George Barclay at the 18th Century Poetry Archive ECPA. Downing, Lisa. George Barclay. In Zalta, Edward N. Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. George Barclay article by Daniel E. Flage in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy International Berkeley Society a list of the published works by and about Berkeley as well as online links Berkeley's Life and Works Works by George Barclay at Project Gutenberg Works by or about George Barclay at Internet Archive Works by George Barclay at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks Another perspective on how Berkeley framed his immaterialism Original texts and discussion concerning the analyst controversy O'Connor, John J., Robertson, Edmund F. George Barclay. MacTutor History of Mathematics Archive, University of St. Andrews. Contains more easily readable versions of New Theory of Vision, Principles of Human Knowledge, Three Dialogues, and Alsafron. An extensive compendium of online resources, including a gallery of Berkeley's images. A version of Berkeley's PHK condensed and rewritten for faster reading at the Wayback Machine archived the 17th of March 2006. Electronic texts for philosopher Charlie Dunbar 1887 1971. Broad, CD Berkeley's argument about material substance NY 1975 REPR of the 1942 ed. PUBL by the British Academy London Broad, C. D. Berkeley's Denial of Material Substance, published in The Philosophical Review, Volume LXIII, 1954. Rick Grush Syllabus Empiricism, J. Locke, G. Berkeley, D. Hume. Berkeley's 1734, The Analyst, Digital Facsimile.